and welcome to the very first Every Brain Matters podcast. I'm your host, Aubrey Adams, and director of Every Brain Matters, a community of support, advocacy, and science. I'm a former Colorado mom who sought refuge in Texas due to the harms marijuana caused my family and my community. We ask you to subscribe to our podcast and give us a good review as we share valuable, important information. In this series, we are looking at a condition called CHS or cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. It's a mysterious illness that often goes undiagnosed. In part one, we spoke with Dr. Renette Lev one of the first ER physicians to bring awareness to CHS and use the word scrometing. In part two, we are grateful to have a Colorado ER physician who has been educating the medical community and the general public about CHS ever since Colorado legalized marijuana. Dr. Brad Roberts, welcome. Okay, thank you Dr. Roberts for being here today on the Every Brain Matters podcast. The first question I have for you is, have you seen an increase in ER visits for cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome since medical marijuana was legalized in 2000? Oh, certainly. I mean, those cases have certainly gone up. Um, I would say it was something that was fairly rare to see. I remember you know, back when I was in residency around that, uh, that time that, you know, I think I saw two cases in my entire residency and it was something of kind of an anomaly. My program director was sort of, hey, this might be a thing. And now I would say on average, at least me or one of my colleagues would see a case almost every shift I work. Um, So certainly an increase. Um, I think the numbers, I so I actually was doing a research project with some of our residents here here in our GI fellows to try to look at uh, endoscopy findings from people with cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. And as part of that, you know, we just charted a number of people who had an ICD-10 code for intractable nausea and vomiting um, that were admitted and ultimately went to endoscopy. Um, and not all the patients that we looked at went to endoscopy, but of those patients that were admitted that also had a, either a social history or a urine drug screen positive for cannabis. And those numbers, I think, went from about five when we started in 2008 to over 120 cases, I think, from 2018 was our last year. So, you know, remarkable, substantial increase. Wow. And can, can you describe kind of, kind of the diagnosed criteria or the step, how, how you come up with the diagnosis of CHS? Yeah, so in general, um, there are people who have been u- using cannabis for a long period of time. Um, often they've been using it for years and are often people who are using higher amounts and in higher frequencies. So often the higher potency products and people who have been using uh, daily or multiple times per day are your most common people will end up with. Um, oftentimes it's people with intractable nausea and vomiting. So one of the things I look for is typical like viral gastroenteritis, nausea and vomiting. Those typically get better with our anti-emetics. Cannabinoid hyperemesis patients don't seem to have any response to our typical anti-emetics. And, and just to speak a little bit, maybe less medical, that means medications we give for, for treatment of nausea and vomiting. So oftentimes we can give people Zofran or Phenergan or Compazine, Reglan, and people will have a good response to that. Um, People with cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome do not. Um, They don't seem to get any improvement with our typical medications. Um, Oftentimes they, you know, historically um, it was talked about that we would always ask them if they took hot showers. um, And that was part of the diagnostic criteria is that they had relief with a hot shower. I find that to be less helpful. I mean, for certain people, certainly they do take hot showers, but oftentimes not everybody does. People either may have not discovered that hot showers seem to make an improvement for it. Um, I haven't noticed that necessarily everyone gets better with a hot shower. So I, I don't know, you know, typically, for, historically, they, there was talk about using capsation, a cream that, that kind of caused some heat in the stomach as a treatment outcome. Um, a lot of these people don't seem to respond to it. Um, I will say that it's, it's still somewhat of a diagnosis of exclusion. And what I mean by that is, is first and foremost, when I see these patients, I'm looking for other emergent causes. So we would be looking for a small bowel obstruction, appendicitis. Um, other things that may cause intractable nausea and vomiting. And oftentimes once you've ruled those things out and you have somebody that's a daily cannabis user, not getting better with your typical antiemetics. And the other kind of telltale sign is that these people, it's not like a single episode of vomiting. They are retching and violently like a screaming vomiting. And a lot of the people will call it scrometing. And they do this almost rhythmically. It's about every five minutes. It's not a single episode. 
wait a few hours, and then maybe another. This is just over and over and over and over again, um, which is another part that seems to go with the cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome is, is the, the frequency of it. It seems to be higher than I would see with the causes. So it's, it sounds like they're in a lot of pain and, and really at risk to become dehydrated fairly easily if they're vomiting over and over again. Yeah, that's one of the main complications is dehydration. And, and the thing we really look for is are your electrolytes okay, your sodium, potassium, chloride, uh, and then your kidney function. Have you gotten dehydrated enough that that's starting to affect the way your kidneys work? Wow. Um, and you use the term re retractable vomiting. Is that correct? Is that, did you use that? Uh, intractable, meaning it doesn't go, it doesn't get better. Okay. So when, when you can't get a patient to stop vomiting, what usually happens after that? One of the hard things with cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome is that there's not established treatment. Um, and what, you know, for a lot of things, like you say, we have pretty standard medications that we use. Cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome as of now doesn't really have that standard. There's not a paper that says, you know, for people that have cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, we use this medication. So there's still, in, in my opinion, a lot of trial and error. I think most doctors are using the typical anti-nausea and vomiting medications that we always use. And like I mentioned prior, they're really not effective. And, and so I, at least in people who are seeing frequency, uh, uh, this in high frequency, um, more and more what's being tried is sedative medication. So uh, either benzodiazepines, so that would be your Ativan, Valium, things to just kind of start to put them down more or less to kind of make them go to sleep. Uh, and the others would be like Haldol. Those are probably the two most common that I've seen used. Um, and probably the best effect is eventually if we just kind of uh, knock them down, so to speak, they seem to be finally able to get some relief. Um, and oftentimes, you know, with those kind of medications, we're admitting people to the hospital just to make sure that they're actually getting better. We can give them some IV fluids. We can make sure their electrolytes look okay. It's so interesting that, um, you know, the, the media and the marijuana industry and proponents like market marijuana to treat pain. Um, but, you know, with CHS patients, they're not only vomiting, but they're just in pain too. Um, I've talked to a few of them that have it and they said it's absolutely horrible. So um, it, it's quite interesting that, you know, the, the scrometing part of it. Um, when you um, talk to patients and you you've kind of done a, a diagnosis, um, you know, after you run all the tests and stuff, are the families and the patients in denial that marijuana is the cause of this condition? You know, I would say it's highly variable. Um, so there are some people who actually will, you know, once I kind of mentioned that family members at, at this point, it's, it's kind of changed over time. Um, now they've seen it in the news. They've heard about this before. They've got online and Googled, you know, my son or daughter or my, even myself who uses cannabis daily and now I'm throwing up and they can find articles about it and they seem more, more really able to accept it. Not everyone. There are certainly people I've had patients literally throw their discharge paperwork back at me when I told them that was the cause and told me I was a liar and storm out of the emergency department. Um, so I've had both, both spectrums. I think there are some people who are willing... It's interesting to me, I, it, lately the change has been as I've had multiple people tell me, I know that's the cause of it, but, I, but I, I can't stop. And usually what they mean by that, when they try to stop using, they have horrible anxiety, they have horrible insomnia, so they can't sleep, um, they seem to get nauseous and have really kind of classical withdrawal symptoms. And I think that's actually a very significant cause of, of having people difficulty of being able to get over it is there really is a higher dependence component than I think we initially thought. So what I hear you saying is probably a treatment for cannabis use disorder, um, addiction um, needs to be recommended at that point too. I yeah, I think we do need that for sure. And we need, I mean, I don't think as of yet, it's not as commonplace set up all over you know, the country. You can, you can get treatment for alcohol abuse. You can get treatment for cannabis or excuse me, for uh, opiate abuse it's a lot harder for cannabis abuse. There's just not, is not a lot out there so far. I think we'll get there, but I think as of now, you know, if I were just to send somebody to detox for cannabis, they would, they would look at me funny. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and what I've noticed working in the, you know, the recovery world is uh, it takes a lot longer to detox from marijuana, but the symptoms might not be as severe as, as the other drugs, but it's, it's quite interesting. And I, I do know they have marijuana anonymous now in mind. So uh, we've been talking to them and working with them to try to get the word out. Um, 
Is there any other like diet restrictions or like protocols that you give them after you, you've come up with the diagnosis of CHS? Is there any other recommendations that you, you give them? I do. So actually, so first off on those lines of withdrawal symptoms, I actually now have conversations with my patients that, Hey, this is probably going to happen. You need to stop, but you may start feeling severe anxiety. You may have difficulty sleeping. You may have some overlying nausea. And I just kind of advise them work, work through that. Um, because if you can get through that long enough, you're, this isn't going to happen anymore. We're actually going to get you better. And kind of having a conversation about, you know, there is a lot of literature now describing cannabis dependence and withdrawal symptoms when people stop using and, and informing patients, you probably are going to experience that. And I think some of that is, is people have the idea of, well, I use cannabis to help me sleep but not really fully understanding that the reason you're having a hard time sleeping when you don't use it is actually more of a withdrawal symptom. So I think kind of putting that up front. The other thing is a lot of these people um, generally have a lot of mistrust of the medical system. And that's part of why they started using cannabis in the first place is that they didn't trust doctors. Um, so I, I actually like to be a lot more on, on more of a natural type thing. And so of that um, peppermint herbal tea can be a really, it has a lot of good anti-nausea properties to it. I'll usually have people put some honey in it. A lot of times if you can get your sugar levels back up, that helps to sw switch over to glycolysis. In other words, a part of metabolism. So that your body's not building up kind of some of these, these breakdown products when you're not using, when you're having like fat breakdown as opposed to sugar breakdown pathways, if that can make sense. So if you get significantly dehydrated, just getting some of that sugar back in. So my typical recommendation is a peppermint herbal tea with some honey and then just making sure you're trying to initially start with bland foods so that if, and, and things that will increase your carbohydrate levels. So I talk about, they talk about the BRAT diet, and I typically will do something similar. These are just foods that are easy to digest and will help your blood sugar levels kind of stay in a range where you can at least metabolize those sugars. Um, so bananas, rice, applesauce, toast. Um, personally, if I was, this is not necessarily appetizing, but it works well is to just do um, a little bit of some rice and then put some bananas on, on top of it. That gives you the, the quick release carbohydrates from the bananas and long release carbohydrates from your rice. It's easy, easily able to digest and, and probably a good way to start. And then if you kind of wanted to try a peppermint herbal tea with some honey in it, that's, that's kind of the concoction I've come up with. <laughs> well, that has a great recommendation. I think that'll be useful for a lot of those support groups. So we'll get that, that spread around. Um, and what are other um, mental health or physical symptoms or illnesses are presenting in the emergency department that are related to marijuana use? Well, I certainly think, you know, it's well described in the literature and something that I see a lot is the, the mental health component of it. So typically, uh, you know, the most predominant, the most concerning to me are the psychosis symptoms. Um, for people, you know, who hear that word psychosis, that generally means people are having uh, severe paranoia is probably the biggest hallmark, but people will start having active visual and audio hallucinations with it, sort of schizophrenia type symptoms. Uh, and, you know, that's the most concerning. I do think that there's a wide amount of, of depression and suicidal ideation that comes with it, which again is being more and more borne out in the literature that we, we see. Um, <clears throat> That's probably the biggest thing is the psychosis and this, this suicidal ideation. And, and the last question is, you, you wrote, um, was it a meta-analysis or you wrote a study about, you know, compiling the data of, of emergency room visits related to marijuana? Do you want to talk a little bit about that um, and the findings of, of what you found and how you're spreading the word around and educating other um, physicians? Yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of an interesting story. I never went into doing this stuff because I hated cannabis. In fact, it, I probably don't feel like I cared all that much about it, frankly. Um, I, I never used it. I had friends who did, but I started seeing these cases in the ER. And just as part of that, I, it, it was a slower day, which is rare for us, but we had a day where I had just seen a case of um, a psychosis type case and thought, man, I am sure seeing a lot of this. Um, and I got on PodMed and literally just typed in cannabis. And I found an article that was done by Nora Volkow from, the, from NIDA. And I read that and thought, huh, I don't think I've ever learned any of these things about cannabis. And so actually, then I went home and I pulled up my, my text. You know, I have a whole bookshelf full of all my textbooks from medical school and residency and pulled those out. And I found in the, the Tintinelli's, which is the large emergency medicine textbook, um, there was like one paragraph on marijuana. It didn't have anything in and about it. And I had just finished a large toxicology rotation and thought we didn't even go over cannabis. Like we didn't even touch on it. 
So then I got back on PubMed and started reading a little bit more about it. And I was, you know, at the time there was a lot of discussion in our community in Pueblo about cannabis. It was all over the newspaper and generally everyone had said that there was no research. There was no research. We needed more research. There was no evidence of one way or the other. And I quickly found there was a ton of research that had been done. There was data. There was lots of research on cannabis. Um, and you could find, again, pages and pages of articles. I think in the, the article that I wrote, I had over 126 citations. And, you know, I don't know how many, but that was just a portion of what I looked at to write that paper. There was a lot of different research articles that had been written on cannabis across decades and all across the world. This hasn't just been in a U.S. problem. This has been all over Europe, Australia, Canada, all over the world, down in South America, have all written papers about this. And so as I started reading these, um, that's when I really started finding out there's a lot of, of data on the psychosis component of it. There is actually is some data on the, the suicidality portion of it. There's a data on the cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. Some of the interesting things is like the cardiovascular outcomes. There's increases in heart attacks, increases in strokes. Um, it can affect your respiratory pathways so that it decreases the amount of um, steel you have to remove mucus and so there's increased incidence of incidences of pneumonia upper respiratory tract infections um, can worsen symptoms of asthma um, and then the other component of it that was was somewhat new is, is all the different type cultivation techniques and the effects that those might have so uh, you might have pesticides you might have heavy metals you might have other chemicals that are brought into the plant and that are now being ingested by people using it um, which again was something kind of newer that I had learned um, you know, and there's a lot of things I didn't touch on. There's a lot that talk about, an, you know, the environmental impact of doing this. Um, that, you know, I didn't even write about it in my paper, but there's a whole a litany of literature out there that well describes those impacts as well. Um, that's just a kind of a little bit off the cuff of the things that were out there. But there was quite a, you know, just I encourage anybody just go on PubMed and type in cannabis and you could you could spend I, I spent months reading it so you could easily find that there's not no data there's plenty of data and if they wanted to find your paper what would they type in to find your you can even just you can even just google it um you can just put in my name brad roberts and i think and i, I should know my own title better but i think it's um colorado emergency department visits related to cannabis or something like that and you, you'll find it pretty pretty readily yes yes well, thank you so very much, Dr. Roberts. That was just awesome. And I appreciate you educating us about CHS, cannabis, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. Thanks, Aubrey. Please subscribe to the Every Brain Matters podcast to hear part three when we speak to Regina Denny, a mother who lost her son to CHS. Hear her passionate plea as she raises awareness for cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. And remember, pot can cost you more than money. It can cost you your health. So stay tuned to the Every Brain Matters podcast. Thank you.